All right. This is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 9, Industrial Transformation in the North, 1800 to 1850. We'll be looking at Section 1, Early Industrialization in the Northeast. So this chapter, really Chapter 9, is about the changes that take place in the northern part of the United States, really up until the eve of the Civil War. Uh, recall that the, well, actually, we haven't gone over this, but um, the Civil War essentially breaks out in 1861. And from the period of 1800 to 1861, the North is a very, very, very different place. So this is talking all about those changes in this chapter. Namely, the focus is on things like the economy and society. Uh, and to a certain degree, culture as well. Right? We might also say in this category of society, you know, this is looking a little bit more at a social history. Social histories would be kind of the history of how everyday people experienced it, not the politicians, not the presidents, not the wars, not sort of you know, those things. Uh, and the transformation that takes place in the North is, in short, the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution is not just an important uh, moment or change in American history. It really is one of the most significant changes in all of human history. Uh, arguably, in my opinion, the second most important change in all of human history, right behind the invention of agriculture, you know, 10,000 years ago. Um, but it dramatically changes the way that people live, that the economy functions. It changes culture, changes the way that families interact. You know, there's a lot about the Industrial Revolution that uh, changes society. And this takes place in the northern United States between the years 1800 and 1850. So in short, what is the Industrial Revolution? Well, we're just going to call it industrialization. It's the same thing. Industrialization is just the process. Pretty much we can kind of summarize this in a bare bones way as it will call it a change in the way goods, goods, so items are made and distributed. Right, so it's a change in the way that goods are made and distributed. And the fundamental change that's going on here is ultimately what source of power is used to make those goods. So if you look at all of human history, all the way up until the Industrial Revolution, everything was essentially handmade, right? People made things with their hands. With the advent of industrial society, everything is made by machines. And that's ultimately what the, um, what the transition is. Now, it wasn't quite this smooth. Uh, you know, there were some steps along the way. But in short, we're going from a, a world in which everything was handmade to a world in which everything is made by machines. And what's powering this is the uh, power source, right? So this is also kind of another way of thinking about the Industrial Revolution. Before the Industrial Revolution, everything was made from natural sources of power, i.e., um, you know, let's take, for example, the process. Uh, we'll just use the example of making things, right? So the first sort of natural power source that one might have is human power. That is for a person to essentially create something with their hands. Maybe we'll use the examples of shoes. Um, you, know, uh, you know, shoes before the Industrial Revolution would have been made entirely by uh, humans. But there were also some contraptions and sort of devices that people could create that could harness other sources of power. So for example, a sort of contraption or device might be able to harness animal power to hook up a horse to something, you know, maybe it goes around in a circle and that provides some sort of source of power. So again, a natural source of power in animal power, um, you know, in the Netherlands, things like windmills, which, would, which could harness wind power, and ultimately uh, water mills. You know, that could harness water power. Again, some sort of contraption or device hooked up to, uh, you know, in this case, maybe a water wheel or a windmill or an ox or a horse or just make it straight with your hands. The Industrial Revolution is taking all these sources of power and replacing them with steam power. And that is the process of 
eating up water and then allowing that uh, you know buildup of pressure to power some sort of you know piston or other mechanical device. And as long as one is able to continuously um, you know heat up this source of water using in those days coal, right? As long as there's enough coal, that source of power will uh, continue to go. This might be easily more easily um, thought of in terms of transportation, right? So before the steam engine, before the Industrial Revolution, there were really only four ways of getting around. You could walk, you could ride a horse, you could sail on a boat down a river where the you know, water would push you, or you could sail uh, on the ocean and let the wind power sort of push a sail. That was the only way really of getting around. Uh, with things like the steam engine, it allows for inventions like trains, for example, and trains don't use any of these sources of power, they use an engine. And that's fundamentally what's, uh, what's going on here. So that's kind of the big picture. And this has all sorts of different trickle down effects um, on society, right? All sorts of dip, tri triple, uh, trickle down effects on society. So one of the first transformations that we see is this transformation from skilled workers. We call these artisans. Artisans is a skilled worker who hand makes things, right? So I don't know if that's actually a term or word, but hands makes, uh, we'll just say things, right? Makes things with their hands, probably a better way of saying it. Uh, to wage workers, and wage workers are ultimately those that end up working in the factories with the machines. But the process to become an artisan was a long process. First, one would become an apprentice. That would be someone who uh, learned under the artisan. Again, at a time where uh, you know, literature and literacy was not very widespread. You know, if you wanted to be a shoemaker, the only way really of doing so was to learn under an artisan shoemaker, and they would teach an apprentice. Once an apprentice had gotten enough knowledge, they would become a journeyman. A journeyman was sort of a, you know, kind of the, the midway tier. And once a journeyman was skilled enough, they would then become an artisan. And that would um, be the way that pretty much every single item was made, um, really around the world in some cases, and also in the United States. But artisans began getting a little bit wiser about cutting costs to certain things. So they took some of the more easier tasks, um, the more repetitive tasks, and sort of outsourced them. Uh, we call this the putting out system. You might say outsource the less uh, I'll say less skilled aspects of production, All right? So for example, we'll use the shoe making example, you know, to make a shoe from beginning to end, uh, did take some knowledge, did take some know-how, um, you know, not everybody could do it, but some of the tasks were a lot easier than others. So for example, maybe just cutting the cloth or cutting the leather, and so what artisans started to do was they started to outsource that, namely to farm families. And so farm families who typically, you know, their job was to uh, work on the farm, raise food to make sure that they uh, survive the winter, they would be given this sort of side job from these artisans and they would either, uh, you know, cut leather or cut cloth. Um, they might turn cloth into string. Uh, and they would be paid a certain wage for it, right? So they would receive money. And that was one way of, you know, these artisans or skilled workers uh, sort of cutting the cost in some ways and outsourcing some of the labor. Here we also, we start to see kind of the beginnings of where the industrial system takes place. Sometimes we refer to this as proto-industry. Industry. Running out of room here, but we'll just call it, uh, let me rewrite that. Just call it proto industry. You know, the beginning of the breaking down of tasks from, you know, just one individual person, artisan, to a group of people along sort of this production sense. And again, textiles, if you're not familiar, textiles is cloth. This is really the first uh, major industry transformed. by the, oops, 
by the Industrial Revolution. Uh, ultimately, um, all industries are transformed, right? Like I was using the example of shoes, but cloth is really the first one. Uh, and then pretty much everything uh, ultimately becomes made in a factory or made by machines rather than by, um, by you know, making it by hand. So the rise of manufacturing first took place in Great Britain, and that's important to know. We might say that Great Britain, this is where the Industrial Revolution first happened, right, first happened. So Great Britain uh, got a huge advantage from being the first to industrialize. They could produce cloth for much more cheaper. They could pr produce it more efficiently. And they did everything they can to guard that secret. However, Samuel Slater, he memorized the plans in Britain, came to the United States, and began constructing the very first factories, in this case, the first water-powered cotton mill in the United States. So of Samuel Slater, we'll say he, um, he brought industry to the U.S., uh, Samuel Slater, from a, an American perspective, we call him the father of industry. Uh, you know, the British have a little bit um, harsher of a view. They call him Slater the traitor because he you know, was treasonous in giving the United States this huge advantage in terms of technology. And, uh, you know, this water-powered cotton mill, again, in this case, used, you know, first used water. So, for example, um, you know, we might have some sort of device, uh, you know, or some sort of structure. And in that structure, there's these machines, and these machines are hooked up through all sorts of different contraptions that allows, um, that allows someone to take cotton, turn it into thread, and then ultimately turn that into some sort of, you know, clothing or, or curtain or, or whatever, right, you're going to use it for. Um, but that would have used water power. And so these had to be built along rivers, you know, using a water wheel. And so as you might be able to imagine, you know, as the river flows, right, that turns the wheel, the wheel can then power various, you know, contraptions and devices that it's hooked up to. And that ultimately produces the source of power. What the Industrial Revolution is about is you know, taking this sort of mechanical technology that already exists, but simply just changing this out, ultimately allowing for these mills to be built anywhere, because now it's not required that you're close to a river. It was also the case in places like New England and Great Britain itself that during the winter, uh, the water might freeze. Uh, some times of the year, you know, uh, summertime, fall time, the water would flow very rapidly, and other times of the year it wouldn't, so it was inconsistent. But a steam engine, again, in the process of the steam engine is to simply just throw coal on the fire and that can power some sort of piston. You know, that can go 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as long as there is um, coal to be had. And you can, you can really build them anywhere. And so some of the very first uh, cotton mills, again, using cotton and transforming that into a finished textile product, were brought to the U.S. by Slater, uh, served as the predecessor these water mills served as predecessors to factories that ultimately utilized steam power later on. Um, but uh, Samuel Slater and his uh, series of factories were ultimately called the Rhode Island system because in the way that they were built. Generally speaking, the Rhode Island system entire or sorry hired entire families, right? So men, women, and children worked in the factory. Uh, they were paid credits. That is not a wage. And in most cases, these were a little bit more rural, uh, located in some of the rural parts of the country. Since Great Britain was the first to industrialize, they also had to deal with the negative side effects. And the United States, in some ways, tried to avoid those. Um, overcrowding, uh, pollution, a rowdy uh, and violent working class. The Rhode Island system was sort of a, you know, a, a hope to reap all the benefits of industry, but also avoid maybe some of the pitfalls. It was rural, it was with families, uh, it was being paid with credits. Now, American industrialization got a pretty big boost due to particular um, 
uh, political events that we talked about in the previous chapter. Uh, Jefferson's failed Embargo Act of 1807, which cut off the United States from foreign trade, meant that investors uh, invested instead in American goods. And the War of 1812 really disrupted a lot of Americans' um, overseas uh, economic activity. Um, you know, the, typically the, the merchant, the buying and selling of goods from Britain, that was heavily disrupted. And so instead, much more money went into domestic investments. We might say of these two, the embargo and the war, we might say fostered more uh, domestic investment in industry. Uh, while Samuel Slater was the first, uh, his factory system was not the most effective. Ultimately, it was the Boston Associates, or sometimes called the Boston Manufacturing Company, that created some of the earliest and most successful factory systems that we would really sort of identify as industrialization today. Uh, this is also sometimes called the, or, or one of the individuals who was part of this process was uh, Lowell. Sometimes you'll hear this system be called the Lowell system. Uh, and this was to create a factory in which everything was made in a centralized location. Uh, we might call a factory just a central location of production and very early on utilizing water power later on utilizing steam power everything was made in one place that is in contrast to this system of proto industry that we had mentioned before where really it sort of served as maybe we'll just draw sort of a quick sort of illustration of what proto industry sort of is but you know it's taking the cheap parts of production outsourcing them to the farm. So for example, each of these red boxes are a farm. You know, they do some of the easier tasks. They send all their goods back to an artisan, which then takes the products and assembles them himself because it takes a little bit of know-how. For the factory system, it's about really making everything in one centralized location. Um, you know, you get the raw materials, raw cotton, it goes into the factory and the finished product comes out. Uh, and that was much more efficient in terms of cost, right? But one thing that came with the factory system and with the, you know, me the mechanics of the, of the tools was a process of de-skilling. And this is a very important um, transition ta when talking about the Industrial Revolution. And this is more broad in general, is that... In regards to industrialization as a whole, we can generally say that work itself went from skilled work to unskilled work, right? Skilled to unskilled, meaning before to make something, you had to have some sort of know-how. You had to have this long process of being an apprentice and a journeyman and learning your whole life and then becoming, uh, you know, an artisan. And people took certain pride in their work. That was all replaced essentially by machines. Now, all the know-how was essentially in the machine and all workers needed to do was to do these very repetitive and menial tasks of making sure that the machines operate. So it might just be pulling a lever or pushing a button or something like that. And um, you know, work went from, in some cases, a sense of pride really a sense of purpose in many ways to, um, you know, to losing that pride in one's work. And that was a big transformation uh, to take place, again, just sort of in the lives of everyday people. Uh, the Boston Manufacturing Company instead chose to hire individual workers. We might also say that they were paid a wage. So as compared to, um, uh, you know, uh, the Slater system or the Rhode Island system, individual workers instead of families, wages instead of credit, and in general, you know, maybe a little bit more urban. Again, you know, we're talking about a time where, you know, all of this is happening really in the Northeast, just a few handful of states like Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Connecticut, very heavily concentrated, again, very heavily centralized. Ultimately, this Lowell system or this Boston Manufacturing Company system, 
uh, put uh, you know the Rhode Island system out of business simply because they were able to make more money. One of the chief constituencies or groups of people that the new factory system employed was young girls, sometimes referred to as the mill girls, in particular the Lowell mill girls is sometimes what they're called. And in this factory system, it required these young women to live at the factory under close supervision. Uh, there was some concern that perhaps these factory systems were not a quote unquote proper place for young women in, you know, you know, was this late 1700s, early 1800s society. And so one of the things that factory owners did was to make sure that there were very, very strict rules there, especially for the young women. It was also meant as a way to create a factory system that was more respectable than what had happened in Great Britain. Again, Great Britain suffered from a lot of the negative aspects of industrialization. The United States could try and learn from that and create maybe, a, like I said before, a system where you reap the benefits of industry, but you don't suffer the, the downside of it. You know, the overcrowding, the violent sort of working class uh, uh, nature of it. Um, and, uh, you know, this could work for a certain, you know, and it did work for a certain time period. Uh, again, rules would be like, you know, no drinking alcohol. Uh, there'd be other rules like mandatory church attendance, very close curfew hours, stuff like that. Ultimately, though, both the Rhode Island system of employing families and the Lowell system of employing young farm girls. That's typically where a lot of these young women came from. They came from their farm. They would work onto the factory. The idea was that they would make money or save up some money for marriage and then leave the factory system to get married and really never to return again. So it wasn't meant to be a permanent position or a permanent job. Um, but ultimately what ended up replacing this system was an immigrant workforce, right? Immigrant labor. And that comes a little bit late, later on, mainly from Germany and Ireland. Um, but ultimately, kind of the, the most, you know, maybe not the most important, but certainly the, uh, one of the most uh, significant consequences of this transition was the increased output. Uh, it simply meant that there were more goods or cheaper, right? Much cheaper. And it gave families access to a consumer culture that never existed before. We might say poor families could now afford just really anything, stuff, right? You know, before the Industrial Revolution, you know, most people maybe had poor people, which was most people, um, maybe had two pairs of clothing, right? One pair of clothing and then a pair of Sunday clothes. They typically didn't have any carpet in their homes or uh, furniture. Uh, families oftentimes shared a bed, shared utensils. All of these things were now being mass produced using factories at a very, very cheap price. And so, you know, just the rise in material well-being as a result of the Industrial Revolution is a huge transformation in just the way that sort of everyday people lived. At the same time, though, the experience of work transformed significantly. You can almost do this kind of before and after. What work was like before the factory, what work was like after the factory. So in terms of schedule, it really went from a schedule that was determined by, we'll go ahead and say nature, or maybe the seasons, to a work schedule that was uh, really, you know, really determined by the clock. And it's with the Industrial Revolution that the clock becomes somewhat of a you know, very controlling aspect of human life. So for example, a farmer or a craftsman would start their work day, typically when the sun rose, and then would stop when the sun set. That meant in the summer that hours were longer, in the winter, uh, you know, hours were shorter. Farmers, most people were farmers. Again, the season dictated what you did. You planted your, when do you plant your stuff? You plant your crops in the spring, I think. You harvest them in the fall. You don't really do too much in the winter. You just kind of chill. Well, with the factory system, you know, none of that matters. 
you know, work starts at a particular time, uh, you know, things like indoor lighting, uh, heat, um, you know, those things really don't really mean that the natural world has no bearing on the way that people work. So people's work schedules were dramatically transformed. People went from working outdoors to working indoors. People went from working, again, building or creating things with their hands to very repetitive tasks. You know, oftentimes these were tasks that didn't require too much skill. Um, we could also say that a lot of times families had worked together on the farms. Now people worked individually, right? Families were quite literally separated as a result of the industrial system. And uh, all sorts of new dangers arose. You know, fire was, you know, a really big issue, especially in textile factories that had open fire lighting. Uh, injuries were very common from the machines. Machines could cut off arms, they could cut off fingers. And oftentimes that just meant, um, you know, one was out of a job. And uh, abuse. Uh, there was a lot of child labor. Uh, you know, not really any laws yet related to labor and, uh, and business. This could involve, you know, quite literally physical punishments. And there were instances when, you know, managers and overseers, um, you know, killed their workers for, you know, messing up or, or, you know, not following or doing something on the job. So, you know, for all of the material well-being, for, for everything that came with a new sort of lifestyle of material wealth, there was also in some cases a very dramatic change in the workplace. At the same time, though, we have to remember that, you know, working as a farmer before 1790 wasn't just rainbows and unicorns. Um, farming is hard work. It's sun up till sundown. And if you don't do the work that's required, um, sometimes you may just starve to death. And that's a very that's a grim reality that pretty much all people face for most of human history. Industrialization in some cases was an alleviation of that, especially with something like the train, which could transport food over long distances. It made things like famine and starvation a little bit less, a little bit less reliant on the natural world. And, you know, famines still occur, but those are more man-made than they are sort of from, from the natural world and or season. So certainly a change. But, you know, it didn't take long for workers to begin demanding for better rights and better working conditions. And we see with the origins of the factory system, the beginning of the labor movement. We just might call this a movement to better working conditions. Uh, workers wanted higher wages. They wanted more freedom on the job. Uh, you know, these early jobs required long hours, strict discipline, very low wages. Your typical workday was anywhere between 12, or sorry, 10 to 12 hours, six days a week. You know, pay was pretty much as low as the business was willing to, um, well, it was pretty much as low as people were willing to work, but businesses wanting to maximize profit um, wanted to make sure that they could squeeze out sort of every single penny out of their workforce. And strikes were one way that workers fought back against these conditions. A strike is a refusal to work until certain demands are made. Right? So less hours, higher pay, Whatever that is, uh, workers demanded, or, or we should say actually, um, that this process or this, I guess, theory is what it's called. It's called the labor theory of value. Um, you know, critics of the industrial period said that this, the labor theory of value, should be reflected in worker pay. Now, essentially, what this is is that it states whatever, it says what value. A worker adds, they should be compensated that value, right? And maybe we'll sort of, we'll sort of uh, illustrate this point, right? So 
Uh, typically, when you take some sort of product, like, you know, we'll say a raw material, we'll just say cotton. You have, on the other hand, your factory, and you have your worker, right? So the cotton costs a certain amount of, uh, you know, a certain amount of money to pay for the raw material. The business owner then has to uh, pay for the machines of the factory. So this sort of, you know, this part of, um, of production is put forward. And I just realized that I'm covering that. So I'll go ahead and scroll down a little bit so we can get a feeling for what we're talking about here. Uh, the business owner, so he's wearing his top hat here. So we know that he's the rich guy. Um, you know, he has to put up these costs in terms of production. Now, the business owner himself, just with buying a factory and just by buying cotton, can't turn that into a finished product like a t-shirt. He needs a factory worker to do that. So that's what the uh, labor value is. And let's say in this case, this worker brings $3 worth of value to this mode of production, right? So the worker plus the factory plus the cotton, you put all those things together. And what do you get? You know, you get something like a t-shirt, right? And that t-shirt can then be sold. Let's say that t-shirt is sold for $6, right? Two, three, four, five, six. Now the labor value theory or the layer, labor theory of value, excuse me, says that for whatever value the worker puts in, in this case, we'll just say hypothetically, he's worth $3. Actually, in this case, because it sold for $6, you could in theory say that his value was worth, actually, no, we'll take this back. We'll add one more. We'll say the cost of uh, transport, right? Transport. You gotta get your product to, uh, to the people, right? We'll say that costs $1. So again, the value of the t-shirt then is $6, $1 for the cotton, $1 for all the machines, uh, $1 for the uh, transportation, and the worker adds $3. Now, the labor theory of value says that those $3 should go back to the worker as reflected in wages. But the reality is, is that the worker would be paid a very little wage, so they might only get $1 in terms of wages, and the rest of the money then goes to the factory owner. And this leads to a system of economic right, inequality. And, uh, you know, it's really about workers demanding the rest of the value that they're, um, you know, that they believe that they're entitled to. So organizations were created like the Workings Men's Party by Thomas Skidmore, we might say founded. Working men's party and of course these were organizations to try and get better uh you know higher pay better working conditions whatever it may be thomas skidmore had some pretty radical ideas he wanted to redistribute um property specifically inherited property and uh you know really advocated for this form of um you know economic uh equality like we mentioned earlier, though, at the end of the day, an immigrant workforce ultimately replaced, well, not really replaced, but contributed to the overall workforce in the United States. These were people from Germany and especially Ireland. And a place like Ireland, people were starving to death due to the potato famine. And uh, when they came to the United States, they were pretty much willing to work for a lot lower wages. And so efforts to try and, um, you know, go on strike and demand higher wages were ultimately counterbalanced in some cases by low wage immigrants who were much willing to, to work for less. We might say of the immigrant workforce, uh, took factory jobs, or low wages, 